Dr. Aaron Hartman, welcome to the podcast. Katie, it's great to be here. Well, I'm very excited to get to chat with you today. And there's a lot of different directions we're going to get to go, but for kind of broad and to start broad and with context, I would love to hear a little bit of your personal story, maybe also about your kids a little bit, because your story is really, really incredible. And I think it's going to resonate with a lot of people. Um, and I'd love for you to also work in a little bit about the homestead, because that's personally okay. interesting to me. I'm sort of slowly moving mm. in that direction as well. Oh, you got to jump in. You got to do it, especially if you have six kids, they will absolutely love it. So, um, so what got me in this was me and my family. My wife actually is a occupational therapist who worked with kids with special needs. And we ended up adopting one of her patients, Anna. And um, Anna had a lot of health issues. She has cerebral palsy, which is a brain a brain damage issue related to a birth trauma. And, and we were told she'd never walk or talk or crawl. Actually, the medical community was pretty was told she'd be a vegetable. And even her therapist, who was one of my wife's best friends, was kind of like, why, why would you even consider this? This is going to change your life. But Becky saw something there that no one else saw. And I just kind of followed her, not knowing better. I'm like, okay, we'll see what happens, you know? And um, one of the first interactions with that, and I, as a doctor, I'm always in the back end of things. I'm always like talking with patients. I'm never on the patient side. And so one of the, the first recommendations for our daughter was you should cut a hole in her stomach and place a feeding tube in it and give her sugar water or formula and make her gain weight. And so talking to my wife, even though my daughter was never supposed to be much of anything, um, we hoped she'd walk, talk, crawl. We had great plans for her because we had, we had faith that things would not be as they people said. And um, and um, just putting a feeding tube in affects a, a child's ability to talk, like just grabbing, grasping all the things, chewing and swallowing is a huge part of kids developing um, speech skills. Crawling, like just the idea of crawling, actually kids learn motor sequences one after another and skipping that, like it just, a child like her would not get to the point of walking without practicing that. So we opted not to put a feeding tube in her. Well, um, the doctor, the GI doctor called Child Protective Services on us for um, child neglect because we refused their their recommendations. And I was like, whoa. And in the, in the special needs community, this happens all the time when parents, mom, usually moms are fighting for their kids and they say, no, this is not right. They actually, a lot of times will get in, in trouble. And so um, we got investigated and ultimately it was not a big deal because my wife actually knew the nurse to investigate us because she's an occupational therapist. And so that was my first um, four way into like, maybe the doctor's you know, um, don't have the best thing out for us. And the thing about it, that the, 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 the inflection point was six months later when we actually found a growth chart for kids with um, cerebral palsy. And my daughter was right in the middle. So the specialist did not know that for a kid with CP, my daughter was normal. And so if we'd followed that path and done that procedure, that would have led to surgery after surgery after surgery. And like the aha moment was maybe the expert doesn't actually know everything. And the exact same thing happened about a year later with eye surgery that was recommended to us. And a year after that with um, orthopedic surgery to cut her heel cords and other things on her. And that's been our experience. Every time we hit a roadblock and someone says, hey, do this ridiculous surgical procedure, we've, we've I've researched and shown, chosen a different angle. And now my daughter is getting ready to turn 17. She texts and emails me. She types to her friends. She doesn't stop talking, <laughs> actually. Um, she's able to self-dress herself and she's actually doing great. And it's like, I have no idea where she'd be if we actually hadn't bucked against the system and gone a different path. And that's changed my family, it's changed my practice, and ultimately it's changed all the patients that I care for now. That's so incredible. And to just call out and highlight a couple of things you said, I think for one, how much of a blessing for her to have both you and your wife as advocates for her in her corner before she could speak for herself. And I think your story speaks to that incredible love of parents for children. And it sounds like you guys really fought that battle from the very beginning for her. And to know now that she's doing all of those things is so, so incredible. And it also reminds me of my experience on a much smaller scale, but just being told by doctors that certain things were normal and knowing that they weren't, but how that normal. definition is uh, so it gets so convoluted and how sometimes maybe even if something is common, that doesn't mean it's normal and certainly not optimal. And um, I say on here a lot, people probably are tired of me saying it, but that we are each our own primary healthcare provider. And at the end of the day, we can work with amazing practitioners to be our partners in that, but the responsibility lies with us or in the case of our children with us for on their behalf. Um, and it, so it sounds like you just have really like advocated for her and really fought to give her the best options in her life. And 
how incredible that she's thriving now as a 17 year old. And I'm sure that was not an easy road. Um, you mentioned though, that this also really influenced your practice and your work as a doctor. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about that and how you're now using that with other patients who maybe have probably quite different things going on in their lives and how that works out. The first thing we start with my wife, you know, feeding is a big thing in the occupational therapy world and started with just real food, eating real food. And so we realized the power of using things like lipids, healthy fats, real food, using food as medicine. But then I started researching, well, how about genes? Are there any, is there a genetic thing behind this? So I spent a year researching these things called SNPs, which are small um, variations in everybody's genetic um, material. You may have heard of the MTHFR gene. That's one of thousands of these and um, started researching that and took a deep dive into that and finding certain nutrients that help my daughter based on her genes. Then um, started researching, well, wait a second, there's energy therapy. This is over in Europe. They're doing this thing called suit therapy, which is almost like this um, thing you wear that has rubber bands in it. And it actually, it's what the, it's actually what cosmonauts would use in outer space to activate their muscles, not to lose muscle mass. So we started doing suit therapy with her. And that was actually my wife that started that part of the journey. And then I kind of got into this whole thing with using electromagnetic field therapy, which they used in Russia and Poland since the 1960s, actually high-end racehorses. They actually use this to help racehorses, fractures and injuries heal quicker. And it's used by elite athletes. And I learned that you could actually use this to activate a kid's brain by putting it on this electromagnetic mat and activating, it's called mice or magnetically induced cellular exercise. So I went down all these pathways and every time I'd go down pathways, I'd take a deep dive for a year or two, come back up, look around. And that kind of led into the functional medicine for you as well. Cause I was like, where's a, a home that I can go where there's lots of people like me doing lots of weird stuff. Cause it's kind of lonely when you're the only person researching and you kind of ask yourself like, is this right? Like, how can this be that there's a whole other continent doing this stuff in the world that I've never heard of it in my medical career, you know? And so we just, I just did thing after thing after thing. And the result has been, I've learned about how diet is crazy important. Nutrition is crazy important. I've learned about how other therapies like magnetic therapy, light therapy, laser therapy, hyperbaric, IVs, a whole bunch of things, but also how energy, like using electrical stimulation can actually, you can actually change a, per, a kid's brain by activating their muscles in the periphery. And I started, then I started experimenting with patients. I'm like, well, I've learned all these cool things. I've got these additional board certifications. Maybe I should try this on patients. And the strange things was, was it actually works on, worked on real people too, like other people besides my daughter. And so it just has been this journey. Even today, I'm still learning. I'm still practicing. I, I feel like I know less now after three board certifications and 20 plus years of practicing than I did when I started this journey, but I've got to, I've developed a healthy respect for what I don't know. And I think that's one thing. If I get one thing, I just, I really know that I, what I know is a drop in the bucket compared to the actual information out there. That's, that's accessible um, to people to find answers when they can't find what they're looking for and searching for. And I think from a mindset perspective, that's huge as well, because that keeps you in a mindset of curiosity and constant learning yeah. versus assuming you have all the answers. So you're not even going to ask yeah. the questions, um, which I would guess people listening have maybe run into in a medical setting in the past is being told by an expert like you guys were that this was the only option um, and having to do the research themselves and, and forge their own path, um, which sounds like it is much more difficult with kids because of a lot of the limitations and like what you guys faced as well. Um, and I had a similar experience. I got to study in Switzerland briefly, and it really struck me how differently they approach medicine there and how some of the things that would be considered fringe here in the U S are so common there and so accepted. And they, even in a medical capacity, they talk to people about their nutrition and their sleep habits. Mm -hmm. And if they're getting sunlight and their stress levels, and then they are more open to things we would consider, you know, by hacks, but to them, it's just part of their normal medicine system. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like you kind of take biohacking to a whole different level, both with what you do with your children and then also with your patients now as an extension of that. I mean, that's, that's one of the things biohacking is a popular term and using different things to change your physiology. And so what I saw with my daughter was she's has a significant neurological health issues can I take that to the next level with hyperbaric medicine, with doing um, lipid therapy or peptide therapies? You know, we put probably 10 pounds of muscle on her over the period of six months doing peptides, which is, you know, there's one peptide called cerebrolysin, actually, strangely enough, it's um, approved in Austria for use for traumatic brain injuries, autism, Parkinson's, it's got indication for ADHD, and you can't get it here in the United States. That's a special shipper from Austria to use on my daughter. And so all of a sudden it's like taking that to the next level and not letting you know, there's one thing called PONS, for example, that's FDA approved to treat balance issues and um, multiple sclerosis. 
but I actually found research in Russia. They're using it with kids with CP. So I have to go to Canada, to Ontario to find a clinic to get the device that bring out here and use with her. And it's like realizing your body has this amazing capacity to heal. And people don't always have to do all these crazy things because the foundation for all this for us has been diet, exercise, different forms of exercise with therapy, um, adequate sleep, sleep, and even our pitch in the homestead, like that has been a healing environment to be somewhere where she's always getting lots of light. She's always outside. She's always getting stimulated. And one thing I, when I tell my story to people, I don't want them to focus on all the weird, expensive, fancy stuff because the foundation of all this is eating real food, using food as if it's a drug, using li lipids and healthy fats, using fermented foods as if they are a drug, using you know healthy green vegetables, using different things as if they are a drug because they, they have the power to actually help your body heal. And so that's been the biggest thing is realizing that the foundational stuff is foundational. And this is stuff that's accessible to anybody. Yeah, I have always found it amazing that people will accept that something like a very small capsule of ibuprofen can give them pain relief immediately, but not be willing to consider that the volume of all the food we put in our bodies in a given day couldn't have an equally or more therapeutic effect. Um, I'd love to go a little deeper on some of those foundational things. You mentioned diet, um, any guidelines you have kind of as like foundational pillars of health that people should start with. Cause I'm a hundred percent in alignment of this. I think there's this trend to get like sucked into the newest exciting supplement or biohack, but I've seen at least in my own life, if you don't have those foundational things and I would put on the list, like sleep being huge, morning sunlight being huge hydration and good diet. If you don't have those dialed in any of those expensive things you do, aren't even going to work as well as they could. Well, like, so for example, you mentioned the whole food thing. So my first principle is eat real food. It's, it's that simple. The problem is what is real food? When 80% of what Americans eat is processed and 60% is highly processed. The highly processed means it's not even close to food. It's like margarine, it's, it's fast food stuff. And so all of a sudden now, 80% of what we're eating is fake. So it's eating real food. And then like starting there and, and removing processed oils. You know, oils are an important part of our brain function. Your, your brain's mostly fat. All of your cells actually the surrounding structure of them is actually a lipid membrane that consists of cholesterol. 40% of the fat in your cells is actually cholesterol. You need healthy cholesterol for your brain to work. I mean, how many, for 20 years, we were told don't eat cholesterol because it's bad for you. You know, and one of the results is if all these kids now with neurological issues because they're born the moms that didn't eat fat for the reproductive years. And it's amazing how these basic things like healthy fats, real fats, and one of the ways we use that as a, as a biorack is we, we get this balanced omega-3, omega-6 oil. It's a clean oral. We make mayonnaise out of it. My kids put, we make homemade French fries out of um, camote, which is like um, a root vegetable, like a yam. And now they're shoveling this balanced omega-3, 6 in their mouth, getting massive bumps in their, in their uh, omega-3s and 6s from a food that's acting like a drug. I make it this granola. That's a nut-based granola. And they'll just make it like a cereal. And all of a sudden, now they're getting omega-3, 6 trace minerals and in pharmaceutical doses. You know, one of the things I talk about people with, um, Omega-3s, there's actually this medical product called Bayerin. It's actually a FDA approved medication for ADHD. It's concentrated fish oil. That's FDA approved for ADHD. So really taking real food and then finding what's your health issue. Do you have a gut issue? Maybe you need lots of fiber. Maybe you don't. Maybe you need lots of prebiotic fibers. Maybe you need lots of fermented foods and kind of taking your, the real food to the next level. Like what are you lacking? If you're someone who's hypermobile, as a connective tissue issue, you need tons of bone broth, you know, which is rich in um, trace minerals. You need actually lots of organ meat. You know, 30% of meat consumption in the United States before um, the 1950s were organ meat. No one eats it anymore. And we have, a, we, we have a whole subset of the population who actually need this stuff. So all of a sudden, the real food thing is the basic premise. And then based on you as an individual, what's your niche that you need more of this particular real food like a drug? I love that. And I have definitely taken heat before for saying that I think like processed vegetable oils are one thing that we should not consume in any amount ever if possible to avoid. And I've taken heat from people who quote the studies about, you know, we don't want to have too much saturated fat, which you already addressed a little bit and talked about the cholesterol side. Um, but I always go back to, and you can probably explain this better. It's that ratio, like you mentioned as well with omega-3 and omega-6 and whatever you think of those oils, they're extremely high in omega-6. And it seems pretty um, irrefutable that Americans are consuming a lot higher ratio of omega-6s than previous generations did. But I would love your take on that because it's definitely a soapbox for me of avoiding the processed yeah. oils. I mean, oils are literally food for your brain. If you have a kid, you want them to have to grow. I, I, when I see pre pregnant patients, um, I'm, my thing is you're feeding brains, you're making brains in your belly. So you need lots of healthy fat. 
So to your point about the omega threes and sixes, you know, the there's actually a lot of interesting studies looking at the appropriate ratio being like a four to one, the six to one, probably closer to four to one ratio. The issue is, is if you have too much of the sixes, and, a, and the average American has about a sixteen to one ratio, which is way too much. And so your omega threes are your anti-inflammatory, uh, you know, fatty acids, and your omega sixes are your pro-inflammatory. So arachidonic acid, for example, people say it's inflammatory. That's an omega six. EPA fish oil is an omega three. You need both of them because if you get hurt, you get infection, you need inflammation to, to kill the, the bugs, right? And if you then you need anti-inflammation to calm that down. You need this balance so that you know the, one of the big issues with the pandemic was people were getting sick and inflamed and they couldn't calm down the inflammation. And so you need these things in balance. And the seed oral thing that now I give people is, is these orals, these processed orals are, are partially plasticized orals. You know, petroleum comes out of the ground and we turn it into plastic, right? When you take a natural oral and you change its structure, you are partially plasticizing it. Margarine, for example, that's semi-solid, used to be a, a clear liquid, right? And so now you get these partially plastic orals in your cell membranes. That's going to affect neurological function. It affects um, detoxification of your liver. For women, it affects hormones. So all of a sudden, these, these things that are quote unquote healthy are, are incredibly, incredibly toxic, especially to young developing minds. Yeah, you explained that so well. And I that's when I always love if we can work in an explanation because I feel like that mm -hmm. alone can make a big difference for a lot of people. And I know, yeah. um, like I didn't know any of that when I was in college, for instance. And when I started paying attention to that and shifted the balance of those oils in my diet, I not only felt so much better, but my labs improved, my skin improved, so much happened related to that. And obviously there's much more that goes into health than just that. Um, you also mentioned like fermented foods and green vegetables, um, things like that. Any other guidelines or things that you found helpful related to like protein consumption, for instance, or micronutrients from vegetables or fiber? Well, one of the things with um, protein consumption, women actually need more protein per kilogram body weight than men. So that's one of the things, a lot of women don't consume enough protein. And when you realize that protein is important for making hormones, detoxifying hormones, um, all of a sudden women are, if you're eating a, a lower protein diet, which if you're, it's kind of hard to get, you know, if you're a 70 kilogram female weighs about 140 ish, I'm just using this because it makes the math easy. It's kind of hard to get 70 grams. In. And if you're mildly active, you probably need closer to 90. And it's really interesting. There's these, now these trending diets, they're high protein, actually improving weight loss. Why? Because especially women need more protein. Um, the other question you asked um, in relation to um, other things, you know, water, people don't drink enough water. The average American is dehydrated. And so water is an important part of your kidneys detoxifying, getting chemicals out of your body. There's some things you only sweat out, some things you only poop out, some things you only pee out, and some things you only breathe out. If you don't have adequate water, especially clean water that actually has rich in minerals. So mineral water is actually super helpful. And the trace minerals is a really important thing because our diets consist largely of processed foods. We process out, process out all these trace minerals. One of the things I learned having a farm was you actually need certain things for animals to be healthy. In the animal husbandry world, it's common knowledge that, you know, for example, cows, goats, um, horses need certain amounts of trace minerals, selenium, strontium, barium, silica for the bone health, mus muscle health. We process all those things out of our food system and wonder why people get chronic infections, get recurrent EBV, get recurrent weird heart cardiomyopathy, heart issues from viruses. And when literally sometimes the trick is just giving people the right mineral that their immune system needs to fight these things off. So plenty of water, trace minerals. And that's one of the reasons why I love bone broth. That's because bone broth is and organ meat are natural, nature sources for humans of large amounts of these really rare, rare earth minerals. Yeah. One thing I've mentioned on here a little bit before, but in the past few years, it's really helped is shifting my mindset away from um, looking at like even just calories or macros and looking more at mm -hmm. what is the nutrient density the highest nutrient density per volume of food. Like I'm going to eat food every day. Anyway, how can I get the most nutrient density in that food? And especially for my kids as well. And in their growth phases, like how do we maximize nutrient density in food? Um, and I feel like it does actually kind of take some focus in today's world, because like you said, the majority of people's diets are ultra processed and low in a lot of those really necessary yeah. things. Um, I would love to also talk a little bit more about the homesteading because you, you touched on this and it seems like you've learned a lot from that experience that's translated into your practice as well. So I'd love to know what you've learned and also what all of us can apply from that knowledge, even if we aren't going to jump full into homesteading. 
Well, one of the things, you know, we got some cows, right? And so before I got cows, I started researching it because cows are expensive and you don't want to lose a, you know, a thousand pounds of meat. That'd be a bad, you know, loss. So started researching and found a guy named Joe Salton, which I don't know if you've ever heard of him before, but he's like, you know, you're shaking his head, the most well-known organic farmer, probably in the English speaking world. He's from Virginia. So I met him a couple of times, talked to him and I was talking to him. He's like, you know, if you ever go to these, these organic farms, sometimes you'll notice you see blind cows, you know, cows get flies around the eyes, they get an infection in the eye. And if you're an organic farm, you know, cow farmer, you cannot give them antibiotics. So a lot of the cows go blind, which is kind of sad, but you have to, to keep it organic. That's what kind of happens. And he was like, well, I just supplement my cows with kelp. And they, I haven't had a cow go blind in 20 years since I've been doing that. And like the light bulb went off my head, you know, sea vegetables are mother nature's source of concentrated also trace minerals that you get from eating around the ocean and whatnot. And by giving this to the cows, he's actually boosting that part of their immune system. And one of the things that happens with cows that are fed in the, in the conventional world, they're called CAFOs, contain animal feeding operations, is they give them lots of grains, you know, whether it's soy, corn, forget the GMO, forget the glyphosate, just focus on that part. These things have about 60 or 62 trace minerals that a, a um, mammal needs. Well, there's another 30, a mammal needs about 96 trace minerals for healthy functioning. So automatically by feeding cows grain, they are nutrient deficient. So these cows are going to get sicker. They're going to need more antibiotics. They're not going to be as healthy. And so I realized, wait a second, what's the human version of that? It's like our processed food. And all of a sudden, it made sense to me why in, in um, Japan, for example, they can um, eat large amounts, be exposed to um, chemicals over there and smoke and not have an increased sense of certain cancers because they're consuming nine milligrams of iodine a day in the Japanese diet. And it's interesting because it comes in sea vegetables. And so it's balanced. It's not an overdose and it actually helps their health. And so it kind of like having been being a medical doctor, you know, bees are a great, another great example. You know, um, the, there's, you know, a, um, a queen bee can live three, three to five years and the worker bees will live like, you know, maybe 40 days. The only difference, there's no difference genetically between those two bees. The only difference is one is fed the, the, the one's fed royal jelly and the other one isn't. So literally, this is an extreme example of feeding the queen a certain food makes her live, you know, 20, 30 times longer than a standard bee. And all of a sudden, it's like, okay, how does this apply to humans? And just sitting back and thinking, reading articles, looking into some of the research with trace minerals and realizing in our country, there's a population of about 20% of people who have hypermobility who automatically need more of these trace minerals. And seeing a connection between those people and chronic fatigue, fibro, chronic Lyme, mold, and realizing part of their issue is no one recognized they need more protein, more trace minerals, more collagen. And so like realizing we have this big population in our country that's an elephant, and, I mean, I'm sorry, the canary in the birdcage, so to speak, and they're everywhere. And so like what got me there was, was my farm, was taking care of animals, caring for them, applying to my family and realizing it's all connected. How might a person know if they have that hypermobility type issue? Is that like a genetic mm -hmm. test-based thing or is it, how is that diagnosed? It's a clinical test. Um, an extreme version of it is Ehlers-Danlos, but usually you can do a thing called a bait and score and actually put a little quiz together um, um, for, for doing that. You look at your hands, hypermobility in your hand joints, elbow joints, knees. Um, can you lean over and touch your palms to the ground? And it's based on your age and whatnot. But it's amazing um, in the pediatric literature, 20% of kids have this. You know, and it's it's kind of sort of like a superpower, actually. You know, there's a lot of elite athletes that are hypermobile. You know, your Michael Phelps types types. Um, you know, there's um certain athletic um, sports like volleyball, for example, or swimming that actually attract people that are can jump a little higher or have a little longer wingspan, for example. But at the same time, those people need higher. They basically are like my my son's hypermobile. And I tell him he's a Maserati, good looking car. He's fast. I mean, at, at 11, he was already running faster than me. He already throw a ball better than me at 11. But if you don't put the right gas in the gas tank and do the right maintenance, they break down and they're really, really expensive to fix. And so these, this hypermobile group is just like that. They need, if you can catch it early when they're kids, say, look, these kids avoid processed foods, get lots of bone broth, clean, clean meats, lots of protein. And these kids can be super athletes, but if not, they're also more prone to mold and Lyme. And they tend to see more ADHD and Asperger's and a bunch of other um, neurological issues in this group of people. That is fascinating. And as you were saying that, I'm thinking of one of my daughters who I would guess would probably be diagnosed with that if we tested her, um, who is extremely athletic. And it was like second in the country for pole vaulting last year and can like 
touch the ground all the way with flat hands without even trying, yeah. you know, standing up. So no. that's great to know. I'll make sure we already mm. prioritize protein and nutrient dense diet, but I'll be extra careful mm. with her. It's good to know. Um, yeah. when it Anything comes actually, to actually, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, it actually, could, it's actually related in families. And so when I see one person with that, I always look at the others. So you have six kids, you and the husband, you know, the question is anybody else like that? And people tend to think hypermobility is only flexibility. But it's like, you know, can you bend your thumb to touch your wrist? Does your pinky go back 90 degrees? And I actually have a quiz that goes to this, but it's 20% of the population. So it's largely overlooked. That's so fascinating. Are there any, um, like you've touched on things like bone broth and organ meats and iodine and green vegetables. If someone just wants to sort of like hit the 80, 20 and sort of maximize this at a high level, is there, are there any other checklist items that you would say, like focus on making sure you're at least including these things in your diet or any other kind of just good principles for that? Well, the healthy fats are part of that as well. Making sure you're getting lots of healthy fats, you know, avoiding seed oils. And this is where it's tricky because, you know, omega-3s and 6s come from seeds and nuts, but you don't want to get those processed, expeller, expressed oils. Um, um, focusing on you know, healthy saturated fats. We actually need healthy lean meats. And that's a big part of that. Um, fermented foods are a superfood. You know, we, we have all this data on probiotics and prebiotics being good for this, that, and the other. But the reality is we're, there's a whole field of, um, science showing that actually we need these pre pro and postbiotics. And so what's the one place you can get a prebiotic, which is the thing that actually, um, is like the fiber kind of stuff, the probiotic, which is the bacteria and the postbiotics are actually the things like butyrate, the short chain fatty acids that are actually made. Well, fermented food is actually where you can find all those. So adding fermented foods is another huge, huge thing. And then I really like mineral water. Um, getting a clean mineral water or a trace mineral add in. It's interesting. There's certain, there's a place in um, Nicoya, Costa Rica that has like one of the lowest cancer rates in the world. And they have a very, very high mineral content of the water. And that's a, it's a blue zone actually. And, and the interesting thing is that um, 50 kilometers from um, Nicoya, there's this place called um, Tuiste de Alba, which is the gastric cancer capital of the world, which is where they have these. I was actually spent a couple of weeks with my family there, went to a place, a little mission complex to learn about some Spanish and stuff and had no idea. I was taking my family to the, the cancer capital of the world and um, just learned it was all about the chemicals and the pesticides there. But literally, you know, 50, 60 kilometers away was this blue zone. And one of the keys to the blue zone there was the fact that they have very, very um, mineral rich water, which I thought was really fascinating. So that seems like it's worth even, what do you think of trace mineral supplements or drops of adding to water for people who know that their mm -hmm. water supply is not going to be great for that? Yeah, it's, um, yeah I, I, recommend that, I recommend that to a lot of patients, particularly patients with um, POTS or dysautonomia, chronic fatigue, people with like a lot of blow, blood pressure, brain fall kind of stuff. Those people tend to be deficient. People focus on magnesium and potassium and they don't realize you need the other 96 minerals for those two minerals to actually do their job appropriately. So I definitely recommend it. Just getting a really clean source for those trace minerals to make sure that um, um, people are getting what they need and not other chemicals and heavy metals and all that kind of fun stuff. Got it. Okay. And I'd love to circle back because you mentioned peptides earlier. And I feel like at least in the US, this is kind of like the new kid on the block that people are starting to talk about, but don't really fully understand. It seems like there's maybe some like dangerous level experimentation going on with people who don't know what they're doing, but also that these maybe do have a really profound ability to help with certain things if we understand them. Um, it sounds like you use these with your patients and also you've used them with your children. So I would love kind of a brief primer on peptides. So peptides are short protein, very miniature protein molecules is the way to think about them, that your body naturally makes. And they're signaling molecules. So they're not as they're not as they're not like hormones. They're like the molecules that tell hormones what to do. So for example, testosterone is a hormone, but you have um, growth hormone, which is a peptide actually, or a CJCF and Merlin or peptides that can tell your body's testosterone what to do. And so your body makes these things naturally. And, and people don't realize the very first peptide was insulin. How long have we been using insulin? 70 years. And so the science is actually very, very old. It's just now that these can be reproduced at like this crazy fast rate, we have over hundred peptides now you can purchase. The um, issue with peptides is people are using them indiscriminately. So there's certain things like um, human growth hormone or um, um, I'm sorry, HC, HCG, which um, human chorionic gonadotropin, which is, was used for years and years as a growth factor that can actually increase your risk for cancer. And so that's one thing that that's not saturatable, but other peptides like CJC and Merlin are, they won't actually overdose your body. So that's one of those things that people that are hopping in this world don't realize that these signaling molecules 
actually, some of them, actually there's, you can't overdose on them. Some of them you totally can. And some of them, you know, like the one I just mentioned, if you give it to a, a um, female in menopause, 50 ish, 51 ish type, a high stress, you can actually jack her cortisol up and give her a lot of weird symptoms. And so it's a very unique world that has a lot of benefits. I've used it for, um, for patients with great results, but it's being used indiscriminately because it's not regulated. You can buy them online. You can, anybody can buy these. And the problem is that there, a lot of them are coming from these third parties that aren't clean. You're not getting what's in the product. And so I only use um, certain pharmacies that actually I can guarantee what's in them, but they're a great tool, um, particularly in patients. When you hit walls, sometimes you hit a wall with a patient with their chronic fatigue or the fiber or the mold, for example, or their autoimmune issue or their gut. And you're like, I need something. I don't want to use a steroid. I don't want to use a crazy drug. Can I use something else that actually might get me over the hump that your body naturally makes that'll just help push your body's physiology downstream. And that's kind of where peptides come into play. Okay. So it sounds like a good rule of thumb is to work with someone who knows what they're doing with peptides. If you're interested in that and make sure you're sourcing them from a high quality source yeah. before you start experimenting. Okay. Um, you've also mentioned the connective tissue aspect a couple of times, and I'd love to know if there's anything else related to this for people to know, because it seems like um, just anecdotally, we're seeing a huge increase in things like knee and hip replacements and people who are pretty young still. And it seems like these are on the rise. Um, if that is actually the case, what do you think is the reason for that? And what are some things we can all do to protect our connective tissue? Well, I mean, ultimately connective tissues connect everything. They hold your organs in place. They are um, a part of your body's electrical system. They actually innervate, they're innervated by your nervous system. And so they give a lot of feedback to your brain, which is super duper important. Um, but what's, what we haven't realized is we've, the connective tissues have been ignored in medicine ever since they were discovered. They're just the stuff you have to go through to get to the heart when you're doing a, 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 an autopsy or you're doing your cadaver work. They actually serve a function. And we're finding out is, for example, kids with um, spectrum disorders, which is your ADHD, autism, OCD, PANS, PANDAS, um, dyslexic kind of kids. If you're hypermobile, you have a 400% increased risk of having one of those things. 400%. Well, why is that? Because because of the uh, hypermobility, one of the things with those individuals is they have they have um, a quicker starter response, a little quicker fight or flight, which actually in certain situations can be a good thing. You can be like the quirky scientist, but it, with if they grow up in a fat, uh, low fat environment, processed food, moldy house a traumatic environment, high stress, they're put in front of a computer screen at age one, their brain can't handle that. It's the Maserati, it's gonna crash. And so I think one of the reasons we're seeing, like for example, with um, a lot of females particularly, this really these really bad arthritis in the 40s and 50s, they have mild hypermobility and you can just wear a little more. And organ meats, again, were part of our diet, you know, 70 years ago, we've removed these things and replaced them now. I mean, for a while, veganism was all the rage. You know, if you're hypermobile, being a vegan, I mean, I know people love it and it's great, but it, it's actually probably the worst diet out there for someone who's hypermobile because they need lots of these trace minerals and lots of protein. You can't get that from a, from a vegan diet. And so that's where I think there's a whole lot of things at play, but the connective tissue thing is really big and it's overlooked and it relates to neurological issues, gut issues, autoimmune issues. Um, you know, even the people with chronic Lyme mold, having this makes it harder to detoxify it makes you have more like trauma brain response. So it just plays into a whole lot of different things. Yeah. And it seems like this is great to know, like in the case of our kids at an early age, like you mentioned, so we can give them the foundational yeah. understanding to nourish themselves for their whole life. Um, and I'll mention a couple of recommendations I've made on here before that are typically not popular ones, but that make a big difference for me and how I feel, which are that a few times a week, I'll eat a little bit of raw liver that I've cut into kind of tiny pieces. Mm -hmm. And I just sort of swallow it because I don't love the taste, but that's an easy way to get liver in pretty easily. Um, and I'm also a big fan of things like sardines for lunch because you get protein, you get a lot of micronutrients. Um, they're small fish, so they're typically lower in things like mercury. Um, I know people don't prefer those foods. Cause like you mentioned, we've moved away from them in the modern diet, but they're inexpensive. And like you said, they're kind of like nature's multivitamins in a sense. I mean, your smash fish, your sardines, mackerel, anchovies, um, your herring, these are all these small fish that, you know, if you're Irish, you know, pickled herring, it was poor people's food, you know, um, it was a thing people ate commonly. And now it's like, well, you have to go to frou-frou French restaurants to get liver and, and organ meat stuff. And, but these do have a lot of nutrient value. I have one of my patients, actually, a young female, she's 29, came to see me with um, chronic fatigue, fibro pots kind of stuff. And she's gotten off all of her, med all of her stuff. Her gut's doing great. And she, she eats liver every day and she actually craves it. 
she actually craves it when she doesn't get it. She doesn't feel quite right. And she's someone who's also hypermobile all the way. And so is her mom. And it's interesting how people sometimes will gravitate to what their body is lacking. You know, the body knows what it needs. And sometimes it just has these, these, um, these cravings for these things. Yeah, that is so fascinating. I know, um, typically I think I'm pretty aligned with my body in that, but when I've done like five day water fast, mostly for like spiritual or mental reasons, I noticed that by the end of it, I, those are the foods I crave. Like I will really strongly crave like anchovies for instance, or things that I wouldn't normally think to eat. And it's like, my body's telling me like, that's the specific nutrients we need when you start feeding us again. Yeah. That's so fascinating. Um, I've also heard you or, or read that you say in your work um, that everything is like, it's all connected. And you also mentioned that if you were going to give a TED talk, this would be something that you would work into that. So I would love to hear kind of the big picture of that. And then also how that influences how you work with your patients. Well, you know, in, I, I tend to be, you know, a little nerdy sometimes. And the, the analogy I give is just, you know, if you've ever seen a, um, a, a compass, the needle shakes at about eight Hertz, which is about the same frequency as your brain activity. Well, that's caused by the Earth's electromagnetic fields that are result from magma moving under the Earth. So, okay, the Earth magma makes the compass shake. Well, you all, these electromagnetic fields are also important for brain function for every mammal on the planet. Um, the reason why astronauts lose muscle mass and bone mass is not gravity. It's actually, they get, they get extrapolated, removed from the Earth's electromagnetic fields. So all of a sudden now, something as basic as magma going under the Earth is related to your, your mental function, your bone function, your whole body system's working. And it's really interesting that, that the macro, that's such a big, big thing. And this, and this, these electromagnetic fields actually protect the earth from having its atmosphere tore off by the solar winds. That's how interconnected everything is. Like literally liquid iron, you need it for life. And so that's how, how interconnected things are. And it's infinitely interconnected. And in my world, I get the big and the small. How is, how are, you know, there's things in plants called mRNA, microRNA. You may have heard of these before, right? mRNA. Well, actually living plants have mRNA and they actually signal your body's proteins to do certain things. So literally eating living plants signals your body's proteins, your DNA to do certain things. So that's how smallly interconnected you are to plants and to the earth around you and how big things are. And the more and more I learn, I learned that everything is infinitely connected. I, I, the analogy I use is like a 3D spider web. And it's all these things going all over the place. And one of the things I love doing when I see patients is to see like their 3D image and start to figure out how can I connect these things and this person's health. But that's how crazily interconnected things, things are. It's, and I, I, used to, I like to say it's infinitely connected because it seems like the more I learn, the more I realize things are pretty, pretty connected. That's fascinating. It makes me think of, um, I read a book a while back called the body electric that sort of talked in, you mentioned yeah, the body's yeah. electrical systems. Um, yeah. I feel like this one gets like largely ignored or only talked about maybe if people are concerned about like EMFs for instance. Um, yeah. but it seems like this is something that is, has extremely far reaching effects into a lot of areas of health. Are there any other things we can do sort of to optimize the body's electrical system in that sense? Optimize, optimize. That's a great question. Well, you, you really, you really need a lot of these trace minerals. Because what happens is the, um, the, the energy differential between your membranes is determined by um, calcium and other minerals. And so one of the issues with that is if you don't have enough potassium and magnesium and calcium, these trace minerals, your body has a harder time maintaining that, that um, electrical potential, which is used in your neurological system. The other thing is like being outside in the sun, um, touching the ground, the earth actually resonates um, energy. That's what lightning is. Lightning is the energy going from the, it looks like it's coming from the sky down. It's actually going from the earth up. That's how lightning works. And the earth actually has this energy that when you go out and you walk on the grass or outside in the sun, that we've actually discovered that now that there's actually photoreceptors in your skin that activate your nervous system when you actually get infrared energy from the sun. That's the reason why you got in the sun in the spring and you feel better. And so that's, you know, if you want to improve your body's energy, being in the sun is super important. Being out in nature is super important. Actually, Having your feet touch the ground, which I know is kind of weird, and you don't want to, you know, step on nails and stuff, especially if you're on a farm. But those are natural, and then obviously the minerals. Those are ways you can actually improve your body's energy. But then there's the whole idea of meditation and prayer, which is hard, largely overlooked. Like we have this psycho, this mind-body connection that you can actually get a PhD now at um up at um John Hopkins in this this field of medicine, where how does your mind connect with the rest of your body? And so having a good state, you know, what's your personal regulatory practice? Do you meditate, pray? Do you do breathing exercises? Do you do yoga? What, what, what's your thing you do that helps ground you? And all of a sudden that, that's how kind of how you kind of maintain your body's energy, so to speak. And it sounds kind of 
weird and wonky, but when you have one of the top neurologists in the country, Dale Bredesen, who uses this with his, with his um, Alzheimer's patients and is published in this, you realize this is real, like cutting edge medicine. It's not woo-woo stuff. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought up all those aspects. And I think there's so much more to learn on that topic and all these topics. Honestly, I feel like we could maybe do a round two one day entirely just about that or entirely just about peptides, for instance, and we'd have yeah. hours worth of things to talk about. <laughs> um, but you mentioned your practice and how you take what seems like an extremely unique approach that's really, really effective for a lot of people. Um, people may be wondering, are, are you accepting new patients? Can people work with you? And how can they find you online if they want to keep learning from you? Um. Well, I do, I am sipping some new patients. So people can just look for me, Aaron Hartman, MD. Um, I've written my um, practice is richmondfunctionalmedicine.com. Um, I, I do a lot of education. We've had over like 200 blogs on our, our website. So people want to learn about mold or Lyme or cardiovascular disease or whatnot. Um, I have social media and YouTube as well. So I have a lot of, and all my website is the hub for all that. So if people want to start learning about what I do, I just have them go to my website, richmondfunctionalmedicine.com. Um, but I think, you know, we really believe in education. We believe education empowers people to take charge of their health. And if people don't know, they can't really act. And so one of my beliefs as well is that our bodies were kind of made to self-heal, self-repair. And if people can learn like what their body's lacking, what's the infinite, then I really think 70, 80% of people can get better on their own without lots of fancy tests and lots of fancy doctors. So I've tried to make my website and the things associated with it, like an educational hub where people can go. That's reliable. It's dependable. I'm a, you know, I'm a triple board certified medical doctor. I've got a lot of bells and whistles behind my name. And this is like quality information where people can learn more. So that's kind of what I put together to help people empower people to take charge of their health. I love that. I had another guest recently who made that point as well. She said, you know, people get like, feel like their body's ganging up on them or that their body's out to get them. She's like, no, if your body wanted to kill you, it could do it in less than a second. <laughs> your body is always on your side and it wants to heal. Yeah. It's about how yeah. do we support the body and doing what it already wants to do and, and kind of Absolutely. like partnering with it, becoming its friend. Um, I'd also be curious to know on a personal level, sort of what your own 80, 20 first principles that you do that are your non-negotiables when it comes to health, whether it's daily habits or regular routines, things that you take or do that you feel like are most impactful for you personally? I mean, one of the things I really need is my personal time in the morning. I get up in the morning, I read my Bible, I meditate for a bit, um, going to the gym, exercising routinely, um, sleep is huge and eating real food. Um, and then spending time with the family. Like those are the things that actually, like if I do all that stuff, I feel pretty good. You know, um, life is good. No matter how crazy the work is or how crazy life is, I feel good. Those are my personal non-negotiables. It's and it sounds so simple. Oh, that's so basic. But it's like, you try doing that every day for the last 20 years and see how easy it is. It's actually quite, quite hard. Yeah. I mean, I think those are two like profound things that stand out to me in, in our conversation is how that idea of like, the more you learn also to realize you, the less, you know, and that, that staying in curiosity actually makes you more able to keep learning and to keep iterating and improving. Um, and then also what you just talked about that the simple foundational things are often the most profound, especially when we do them consistently. Um, a couple other questions I love to ask at the end of interviews, the first being, if there is a book or number of books that have really profoundly impacted your life and if so, what they are and why. Um, I read a lot and I'm reading all the time. So this book changes from time to time. The, um, the, the most recent book I actually read that was profound was the uh, Gulag Archipelago by Andrei Solzhenitsyn. And it was just a book about the, um, the, um, com the, the camps in Russia from after World War I through the 50s. And just to see um, not just what people can do themselves, but what people can do to their own people. And just to kind of get that I. I can't, I can't understand that what's going on in certain parts of the world. I can cognitively read about it and understand it, but I just can't, as a Western, I can't fathom like why people do these things. It was just eye opening that, that, and that stuff still is going on today. Um, you know, um, that's probably one of the more ones. Um, another one, Victor Frankl's the, um, um, actually, um, actually, I think the most recent one I read was, um, um, his man's search and meaning was really interesting. Just how, how, um, in a, in a camp in World War II. I actually started reading a bunch of these a couple of years, like two years ago when things kind of went a little bonkers. Um, like how even the worst of situation in the world, like if you have a meaning, you can literally survive the most horrible conditions just if you have a purpose. And so it's really interesting. And that's and that kind of plays into the whole Gulag Archipelago because the people who survived these most horrible conditions, they had purpose. They didn't have anything else but a purpose. And that is so impactful and profound because I feel like in, in America today, we all, if we can't find purpose in the richest country in the history of the world, it's like, you know, we need to reevaluate our priorities. 
Well, I'm excited to check those both out. I definitely second Man's Search for Meaning. That's one of my most profoundly impactful books as well. And one that I t- try to reread every year because it really does help you like refocus on being able to choose your own response in every situation, including, I mean, for him, much more tough situations than I've ever encountered. Yeah. Um, Awesome. I love it. I know that you also are a very busy doctor with a time constraint. So lastly, any parting advice for the listeners today that could be related to something we've talked about or entirely unrelated life advice? The parting advice is just never, ever, ever give up. You know, listen to your body, trust your intuition. Um, don't ever give up. That's the one thing people ask me, like, what's different about you and other doctors and your practice and what you do? And the thing is, like, I just, I never gave up my daughter. I've never given up on the rest of my kids. I don't give up on patients. I have patients I've been working with for years that are, every time they hit a roadblock, I learn something new. And it seems like, it almost seems like I learned something new a couple of months before I need it in the clinic, which is kind of scary because it's like, I can't stop learning, but it also feeds me. It's like, yes, I'm not ever going to give up. And so wherever people are at, you know, I just would encourage them, no matter how bad it seems, like don't give up because the answers are there. You can find what you're looking for. It's just, you can't quit. The difference between amazing success and rabid failure is quitting. That's the only difference. I love it. Well, I think that's a perfect place to wrap up. And I feel like we got to touch on so many amazing topics and I'm very, very grateful for your time and being here today and for all that you've shared. So thank you so much. Okay. Thanks a lot for inviting me on. I really enjoyed this time. And thanks as always to all of you for listening and sharing your most valuable resources, your time and your energy and your attention with us today. We're both so grateful that you did. And I hope that you will join me again on the next episode of the Wellness Mama podcast.